storage to the SAN. Uh, this is an introduction to SAN creation with Edo Extreme Core Storage Controllers. We're going to basically show you how a piece of hardware can help uh, improve your infrastructure today. On, on the webinar today will be Suds Jane from VMware, Eric Garrison from Addo, and myself, Jimmy Wren, and the product manager at Addo Technology. So today's agenda will cover these discussion points. We're going to be going through the state of some virtualization infrastructures and how they're set up today. We're going to go through the best practices for VMware vSphere, how things should be set up, and then some, some solutions that can improve your current live migration performance of applications like vMotion. Uh, we will follow up with some product information from Addo Extreme Core products and question and answers uh, based on the webinar. So at any time, if you do have a question, you can go into the little chat box um, and type in a question. We will answer it at the end of the presentation. So the first thing we're going to go through is some common uh, small and medium business virtualization infrastructures, some things that might be limiting them. Uh, and up first is Eric Garrison from Addo. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, a quick little bit about my background. I've been in IT for about up to 20 years now. Uh, with all except the last three years being working uh, for various resellers, most of them being small and medium uh, customer bases. Um, as virtualization started out, there was a lot of concern from business owners, SMB business owners, about virtualization. How does it work? What does it mean for me? What's the impact? And we saw a lot of common questions come across, uh, a lot of common decisions, and a lot of common concerns. Uh, so some of the things that I was hearing in my various roles in IT was, all right, I, I get what you're saying about virtualization, but we're going to try one host and we're going to see how that goes. Then in a couple of years when we get budget, We'll buy another host, virtualize that, and so on and so on. So they wanted to test the waters. They didn't want to do a forklift. They wanted to spread it out over a few years. And then, despite our recommendations, there were bigger concerns to them. Um, one of the concerns being the whole concept of a forklift. Uh, they couldn't afford to replace everything. They wanted to incorporate their current equipment, maybe take their best host, virtualize that first rather than buying a new host. Uh, the recommendations and the best practices, which is something that SUDS is going to go over, uh, a lot of times that set aside. Uh, the concern was, and again, speaking from four or five years ago, a 10 gig network, especially an isolated network just for vMotion or management purposes, was considered a big expense. Um, and one of the other best practices of creating a SAN was considered complex, required special hardware, and it required specialized personnel. And uh, especially in the SMB world, there's a lot of confusion and bad rumors about how complex either an iSCSI or a fiber channel SAN can be. So, these questions, these concerns, generally led small and museum businesses down a path of not following the best practices. Um, budget constraints were probably the biggest thing that I personally saw. Um, they grow their infrastructure slowly. They added hosts, one, what I call onesie twosies. So instead of buying two or three hosts and implementing a structure, doing some testing and then migrating their data, which is generally our recommendation. What they would do is buy a host, say, okay, which applications can I put over to that, and ran it side by side with a bunch of independent servers. Um, to them, the capital expenditure to do a forklift just wasn't there. And a lot of IT managers were told by their management that you just have to make do. We don't have the money in the budget. Um, especially following some of the financial issues from six, seven, eight years ago, that became a recurring thing as people just didn't want to invest in their, their network 
because they didn't believe that they were going to get the ROI that they, they felt they should. So, did we skip a slide? No. Okay. So, usually what ended up happening was, I really think we skipped the slide. Can we go back? Okay. All right. Go ahead. I'm forward. I'm, I apologize. So, what generally happened was that people did one host and threw a RAID array behind it. Um, the reason they did this was they wanted a large volume of data, a lot of times file print servers, SQL databases, exchange servers. They would throw their biggest virtual machines onto the one host, which typically didn't have enough internal storage for it. So they wanted to throw something behind it, uh, your typical RAID array, RAID array such as an MSA, uh, other, multiple other manufacturers making SAS RAID arrays. So a couple of years later, they had the money, they invested in another host, another RAID array that they threw behind it until they ended up with a few hosts and a few RAID arrays behind it. Um, this leads to a lot of complications and a lot of concerns. So they wouldn't follow the best practices out there. And after they had their infrastructure implemented, there was a lot of reasons why they couldn't move to the best practices. They felt that it would have a negative impact on their production. Obviously, anytime you make a major change to your infrastructure, it's going to Im impact your production. Uh, they did not want to have their network go down to upgrade it, even though it could be done in parallel. There was always the concern there. Uh, they didn't feel that they needed the extra capacity. One of the biggest things I heard was, well, things seem to be running fine. Why do we have to beef them up? Why do we have to try and make it better? They weren't sure that the enhanced performance really made a difference. They were kind of used to slowpoke performance. And they always felt that adding something in new was better than an overhaul. And that usually tended to strain systems that weren't meant to be running in that kind of environment. So some of the complications as a result of the failure to follow the, uh, the best practices, they'd end up with isolated hosts. They could not migrate their VM. So if you ever had a problem with a host, the one time you want to be able to migrate a VM off of it very, very quickly is probably the last appropriate time <laughs> is when it's under duress. So you're never going to get a VM to migrate off of a host when the storage is isolated to that host if the host is having some kind of a problem. Its resources are being strained to the point where the ability to do a normal migration doesn't exist. And I've literally been in the environment where we sat there for hours trying to get VMs off of a host that was having some sort of malfunction that we could not cleanly get the VMs off of. And meanwhile, this company's production is getting slower and slower. Uh, the RAID arrays were directly attached to the host. Again, it's a strong beginning model. It's cost effective, but it doesn't lead to the ability to turn on a lot of functions that exist within VMware, such as DRS, the ability to load balance, the ability to migrate data from point to point. Um, the network resources were insufficient. Typically, what I ended up being told to work with was a VLAN off of a one gig switch. And that just is not going to cut it again, especially when that host is under duress and the CPUs are pegged it just tends to be a bad scene. Um, so without going into a, a long, long song and dance, these companies would run into problems. And the problems would cascade to the point where their production was down, the owners are not happy, the IT managers aren't happy, things aren't doing what they felt a virtualized environment would do. Um, 
So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Judge to talk about, oh, one, one more, more slide, sorry, memorized the wrong quarter. So the corporate downtime, again, as we said, a one gig network really, really doesn't cut it. Uh, it can if it's isolated completely on its own hardware, but a shared one gig VLAN typically does not cut it. 10 gig is better. Um, when you're in that direct attached model, data still needs to be moved when you're trying to get it to a new host. The, the goal here is to get all the hosts to see all of the storage. So when you're stressed, these migrations are going to be slow. Um, and other options like, well, why don't we just plug it into another host usually strains the new host as well because you're across multiple hosts, you're basically doubling up another host. So now I know that we're on the right slide. But before we go to the next slide, just what you were saying in these previous slides is that this is the way a lot of infrastructures are today. Correct. And there's ways to rectify without having to do a four-month upgrade to update your whole system. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. So now Sudge is going to talk about some of the best practices for vSphere. Thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you very much. And hello, everyone. My name is uh, Sudge Jain, and I am part of the vSphere product management team at uh, VMware. My focus is primarily on the vSphere uh, in general uh, and uh, more specifically about the IO stack in terms of network, storage stack, and making sure that we are able to get the best of our infrastructure to address the application need in general. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So uh, when we look at the vSphere, uh, vSphere is primarily a compute platform, and we try to address the application need uh, from the vSphere perspective, uh, whether it's a traditional application or are there new needs of application, cloud native application, business critical, tier one, tier two, and uh, you know now we are talking about big data application, and there are many other uh, sort of uh, application we are talking about like telco workloads, IoT workload, HPC workload. So we, we look at uh, in totality the, all those applications, see how we can best run on vSphere as a compute platform. But to make that happen, the storage is one of the biggest need for all those applications. So the storage is something which go hand in hand with the compute platform as well as with the application needs. So from vSphere point of view, the storage is a very big priority. We have been working on it for many, many years on the storage solutions. And we have very comprehensive storage solution, whether you use the VMFS based uh, data stores or NFS or VWAL, which we introduced uh, some time back, and also with Virtual SAN, which is our own hyper converged uh, uh, data storage solution. And everything you can manage uh, basically as a policy based management using our, our SPDM solution. And we try to make sure that we bring the best of the breed storage solution across the ecosystem on top of vSphere platform to address the varied uh, application needs. And those uh, deployment scenarios are different. Uh, when you go to different verticals, the SMB, as uh, Eric mentioned, uh, quite a bit is, uh, you know, standalone uh, RAID arrays, uh, which are not shared, is a very common deployment. When you go to enterprise, uh, with uh, who can uh, have a, and they are very much deployed on the SAN deployments, and we have very heavy investment of uh, SAN as we speak uh, in the VC environment. But from our perspective, uh, compute and storage go hand in hand, and we want to make sure uh, no matter what kind of applications are, no matter what kind of deployments are, scale or vertical needs are, we, were, we like to make sure that storage solutions are addressing the needs of the applications. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, to address that need, I think uh, uh, we need to work uh, and make sure that we have the right ingredients. So ESXi storage stack is very comprehensive stack, starting from uh, right from the virtual devices so where the uh, you know, application attach uh, the, the, to the data stores, uh, VMD keys. 
So we have virtual SCSI, uh, we have virtual NVMe, which we introduced first time in vSphere 6.5, uh, and we are working quite heavily with NVMe uh, and NVMe Forum and NVMe in the ecosystem to make sure that we bring the best of the breed NVMe solution also, both in the DAS, so direct attached storage mode, as well as in the shared storage using NVMe fabric in future. But for now, uh, we have virtual NVMe, which uh, basically you can run. It's a device simulation. You can run the complete uh, NVMe stack in the gas dropping system, uh, whether it's uh, Windows or Linux. And that uh, basically is quite performant and virtual SCSI. But majority of the deployment today are on uh, you know, TV SCSI or LSI SCSI uh, stack. Uh, we also have a pretty comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, our own VMFS, uh, which is the VMFS 6.0, which is quite de well deployed today. And we also support NFS. And these are all, uh, there's a wide variety of choices of uh, the devices as well, uh, whether it's raw device or RDM or, you know, uh, data store back devices as well. And uh, everything goes to our PSA stack. This is our plugin storage architecture. That's where we uh, bring in multiple uh, needs for multipathing or local storage versus shared storage. The complete magic happens in the PSA stack uh, as far as the vSphere storage is concerned. And as well as on the driver side. So this is a, uh, just a glimpse of what the storage stack look like. And this stack basically address the need whether you are using the local data DAS, data storage, data storage, whether you're using file systems based SAN, NAS, sorry, or a SAN, whether it's fiber channel or HPC. And we are able to address all the needs using this particular stack. And also, uh, this stack also is into instrumental to address the need for vSAN, which is our own hyperconvert uh, to the store. Next slide, please. So as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, the, uh, the storage deployments are uh, there. We try to make sure that we are able to address the very need. So there are many deployments are on DAS, like uh, Eric, as Eric mentioned, especially in the small to medium businesses. Uh, the, 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 that's where uh, the, the main driver is the cost, that it's cost effective and it's simple to deploy. You just plug it in play and you don't have to have a special uh, infection need or special operational need to manage your infrastructure, which is based on DAS. But uh, when it comes to scalability, when it comes to resiliency, or you know, or in, in terms of uh, uh, making it a shared infrastructure for multiple infra multiple application, multiple needs, then SAN or NAS are very widely deployed. And we at VMware has a pretty high attachment rate of SAN and NAS. And the new one, which is, uh, becoming more popular as we speak is around our CI solution like vSAN. And that uh, gives you best of both breeds in terms of the simplicity and cost effectiveness of the DAS, but at the same time, uh, all the resiliency and scalability and shared nature of uh, uh, the SAN or NAS function. And it also uh, addresses the need of uh, the, some consumption around the SAN where the operational expenses are high because you need a a dedicated storage uh, person, but in case of hyperconvert infrastructure, that is also not needed. But I think that's a misconception because we have, uh, we have, for example, we, we, with VWAL, uh, a lot of customers are using VWAL, and that's where the whole uh, storage is driven by the VI admin itself. So that simplicity is already in place, but uh, these are the three different choices. And from VMware perspective and vSphere perspective, uh, we are uh, making sure that we are providing all the best, in all three deployment choices, the best of the big solution, whether it's in-house from VMware or from third-party ecosystem like Atro. And we want to make sure that we are aligned with the, our ecosystem as well. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, when we talk about storage uh, infrastructure on this uh, you know, there, uh, uh, there are certain issues when our performance uh, causes which comes up all time to time. And a lot, of, a lot of time, the issues are in the misconfiguration of the infrastructure or connectivity issues not clear or the sudden uh, uh, the performance of the array itself is not up to the mark. There are many reasons where 
uh, storage performance may not be uh, you know, as as per the specification, or uh, but very common area where we see these problems are because of configuration issues or something has not been uh, misconfigured by a person uh, who's uh, supposed to be doing something different, and uh, and also in terms of the benchmark, you know. Uh, when you talk about the benchmark, there's a lot of benchmarks that have been done on VPS storage, and those benchmarks are done in a very specific environment, and the expectation sometimes comes, oh, that is a benchmark, I'm not able to get that kind of performance, but that's the basically, a, uh, I will say it's more of a perception issue, that the pure benchmark versus the real application performance at times is not uh, aligned, and that's very common with any industry in general. And also I want to highlight here is that uh, uh, the storage configuration uh, is uh, need to be done in line with the application need because if you have uh, application which is uh, latency sensitive versus IOP sensitive, then they, you need to make sure that you are right, having the right solution. And if you have one general purpose solution, then you'll get an average performance for those applications. And that's the other reason uh, you know, uh, we want to make sure that when we work with the, our ISVs, who are the software vendors, we evangelize certain solutions, and those solutions are the recommended approach. And there's a lot of uh, information available on VPS and VMware in general, how to use different applications in different environments, what are the recommended configurations. But in general, I want to make sure that the people who are deploying their workloads on each environment, they are aware about the application need, they are aware about the best practice of each year and storage in general, and make sure that they are able to apply those practices. Next slide, please. So VCS with DAS, basically, uh, VCS with DAS is uh, also uh, quite popular, uh, especially in the small to medium businesses. Uh, a, when we introduce vMotion support for the DAS, that makes the DAS a lot more cooler and uh, applicable uh, to the real world scenario. And before that, it was not that practical. Uh, and the many workloads uh, use even in enterprise environment because they don't need uh, all the, uh, the features which are offered by the SAN. So in that case, they want to look for a cheaper and uh, simpler solution with DAS. And we, with vMotion, we have made that uh, very applicable to those kind of deployments. Um, so one, one thing I want to highlight here is uh, that whenever you're doing the DAS and uh, you want to do vMotion, uh, the vMotion creates a lot of stress on the infrastructure because uh, in that case, uh, vMotion has to not just move the VM, but also need to move the storage attached to the VM because it's not there anymore. With that, basically, uh, there are certain guidelines on the vMotion part of the DAS, uh, of the application, but whenever you do vMotion, you have the right kind of connectivity, right kind of bandwidth, and if you don't, uh, then you better use multiple links to get the better performance out of the vMotion. And there are certain uh, areas where uh, vMotion, in fact, also, for example, if you're going from faster storage to storage, slower storage, uh, it will also impact your vMotion performance. So you need to be aware about if you're using DAS and you want to leverage uh, vMotion with that. But uh, in general, our recommendation is uh, that uh, for vMotion, go for 10 gig link. And uh, if you are not able to get 10 link, gig link, you should use the multi link uh, to increase the overall bandwidth capacity for the infrastructure. Next one, please. So overall storage best practices, uh, as I said earlier, is very important to understand the workload, what kind of workload you're running, what kind of uh, requirements are from the workload. And uh, when you're, if you're using arrays, uh, uh, make sure that uh, you use VI capable storage hardware. Uh, that gives you uh, a lot more control and automation with that. And thick provisioning is a recommended approach. Uh, also, we want to make sure uh, you know, you can have one run and multiple data stores, but that's not part of best practice because in that case, uh, it brings a lot of inefficiency in infrastructure. And as far as networking is concerned, 
it's always recommended uh, to use jumbo frame wherever it's possible. Uh, I know uh, you might have infrastructure, especially if you're in a little negative infrastructure and you not have jumbo frame support. If it's possible, go for that. And uh, also, it's recommended that uh, if possible, you should uh, segregate the storage traffic. If not able to segregate the storage traffic, you have the proper uh, um, priority set for the network uh, and the storage uh, differently. And uh, also, uh, have the number of uh, disks required, number of uh, steps required, is appropriately calculated as you go and do that. Okay, I think that's uh, pretty much it on my side. Uh, it will be uh, basically just to summarize from vSphere point of view. Uh, vSphere do offer a wide uh, a variety of choices on the storage side. Storage is very, very critical for any application performance or in general for overall vSphere performance. And we continue to strive uh, to bring best of the breed solution on top of vSphere from storage perspective. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, go ahead and talk to the next slide. I'm going to go off script a little bit, which everybody in the room here is kind of used to me doing. But one of the important things that I'm not sure that everyone really understands is how vMotion works. Um, vMotion actually has two components to it. Uh, the first part is called vMotion, and it generally moves the system state and the active memory from one host to the other. Uh, so this kind of sets up the framework for a virtual machine and lets it start running. The actual data, the components of, the, uh, of each individual virtual machine are stored on data stores as, as files. And those get moved by a component that's called storage vMotion. Now, if storage vMotion doesn't have to move anything, then in theory, your migrations go very quick because there's a lot less data to move. And that's kind of what we're doing here uh, as we talk about our solutions. So keep that in mind as we talk about the options here. So we've talked about the SMB that is stuck in this direct attached model. Um, they have SAS arrays sitting behind their hosts and they've kind of run into some of these pain points that we talked about where they can't easily migrate a virtual machine from one host to the other. So the best, hope, best option for them is to create a SAN. Uh, during, or once they're in a SAN environment, data doesn't necessarily have to be moved in order to migrate a host or migrate a VM between one host and another. Uh, this allows for faster load balancing. Uh, DRS can run in more of an automated role. Uh, DRS is kind of a load balancing tool that lets VMs be migrated automatically or upon recommendation from one host to the other. Uh, it can keep, help keep the entire environment running nice and smooth. Uh, all the hosts would have access to all of the data stores. And they're absolutely within fiber channel uh, SANs and within the parameters of our own product that we're going to be recommending shortly. We have the ability to block off LUNs from certain fiber channel initiators. So we can, if needed, lock down which host can see which parts of the storage. But as a general best practice, you generally want hosts to see the data stores that the virtual machines are residing on. Um, you get the ability to better balance your storage arrays. You can make better use of them. Typically, a small, medium-sized business, you're going to see RAID 5 arrays because that is the generic end-all, catch-all for everything. We know that databases run best on RAID 10s, RAID 50s. Well, those are generally fairly expensive uh, from a hardware cost standpoint. And... For a typical SMB, it may not make sense to have all of their databases or most of their business sitting on one RAID array. However, they would be a lot more efficient if they were. Having a SAN gives you a lot more options to do things like that. And one of the other things, adding new storage doesn't disrupt your operations. You don't have to turn off a host to add more storage in a SAN environment. So what are the options for SANs? 
pretty much at this day and age, we're down to iSCSI and Fiber Channel. There were a couple of other off-search shoots that uh, just never really panned out, Fiber Channel over Ethernet being one of those options. But at this point, most people are doing Fiber Channel SANS and iSCSI SANS. When you look at them side by side, typically the latency in Fiber Channel is much lower than iSCSI. The costs for Fiber Channel generally are a little bit higher than iSCSI. So there is this balancing act. Um, in my own opinion, coming into this industry as a network engineer, as a network administrator, I came to learn that configuring Fiber Channel SANS is about as difficult as setting up VLANs in a network environment. Um, that's something that almost every administrator does and is comfortable with. So a lot of those misconceptions about how complex a fiber channel SAN is are really unfounded. Um, and again, the best recommendation, if you are going to go iSCSI, it should be on a high speed and an isolated LAN, not just carving out a VLAN on a switch that's sharing the same backbone and backplane capacity as all of your other traffic. So we're talking about your complexity. So the complexity we're talking towards small and medium type of businesses. If they're implementing fiber channel, it's generally not going to be as complex as a large data sites, which is a lot easier just in general. Yeah, and most of the environments I've seen, with the exception of perhaps an NFS data store that you would want associated more to virtual machines than your true block storage, you're going to have that uh, wide open for everyone. Okay, great. All right. So we've got these direct attracts arrays, and we've got options. How do we get to a SAN? Well, option number one is obviously let's just chuck it all and, and buy a new SAN. Um, that gets a little expensive, and it requires a full data migration, and data migrations take a lot of time. Um, data migrations can be painful. There's a little bit of a risk to data. If something happens in the middle, hopefully you've got everything backed up. Um, but again, it, from a time and money standpoint, it's probably the least desirable. And your typical SMB owner isn't going to be happy when they've got functional equipment that you are now telling them you can't do anything with because it's just not the, the best practice to go to. So for most of these storage arrays, you may have the option of swapping with controllers. Um, I've given an example of a couple of models of uh, RAID arrays. On those, you could pull the controller, and if you just had a, a SAS controller, you could put one in that was SAS and fiber channel, or SAS and iSCSI. A little bit more expensive uh, than your straight SAS controller, the biggest problem that I ran into is it's very easy to lose your data. Um, you're taking the physical component that created your RAID structure, and you're pulling it out and hoping that the new device that you put in can read that data structure, all the metadata required to, to recreate the RAID and be able to read the data that's on there. Um, more than once, just something as simple as a firmware mismatch on those controllers can cause you to not be able to read the data. At that point, you're restoring all your data from backups. Um, and obviously, a JBOF or JBOD shelf, where you just have single individual drives being uh, uh, accessed by the host, uh, isn't an option. They, they typically don't allow you to uh, swap a controller on something that really is just uh, an access mechanism to uh, raw drives. So now we kind of come down to the meat and potatoes of why we're here, and this becomes the third option. We feel it's the uh, fastest, the easiest, the most cost-effective option, and that would be to implement our extreme core uh, fiber channel storage controllers. Um, Jim's going to have a picture very, very soon about our storage controllers, what they look like. The, the real quick version of this is it is a very, very advanced protocol bridging device that allows SAS disks to be presented on a fiber channel SAN 
was very, very low latency. We're talking a couple of uh, microseconds as opposed to millisecond, which you would typically see on an iSCSI uh, network. So when we do this, we're simply unplugging a SAS connection from the back of the host and plugging it into our appliance. So when you do that, we're not touching the controller. So there is no risk to the data for the end users. And in a VMware environment, simply rescanning the storage typically finds all the data stores, creates a new pathway for them, and you're back up and running. So this is kind of how we get from point A to point B. A little bit of a visual diagram here to show you that our appliance is going to sit and create a connection between the host, which will need a fiber channel uh, storage controller, or a fiber channel HBA, and your SAS rate arrays. Okay. So here's a little bit more of a detailed picture. Um, if you recall the first picture, we had one RAID array going to each host. And this shows how we have the ability to add in another RAID array, another JBOD or JBOD shell. So we could, in theory, and, and we've done this here, we could present a whole shelf of SSDs to all the hosts and enable remote flash for all the virtual machines. So Jim will talk about the specs, about our fiber channel connections, the speed, our SAS connections. Um, here are the advantages. Obviously, I talked about some of these, but we can add, expand whatever storage you have. It gets presented to all of your, uh, your hosts. With the performance, we're creating basically the ability to connect up to 12 gig for your SAS uh, arrays or your SAS SSD cells. We're 16 gigs on the fiber channel. Uh, we have the ability to take advantage of multi-pattern. So your host will definitely see a performance increase just based on the, the pathways presented to us. And the users get a little bit of ROI by being able to maintain those existing arrays. They don't have to buy new storage. So it's cost effective. Some of our storage controllers have up to 16 or to four 16 gig fiber channel ports. Depending on the number of hosts you have, you may not need a fiber channel switch. All the functions of a fiber channel switch we have within the storage controller. Typically, in a fiber channel fabric, they call it zoning. We call it host group mapping, but we have the ability to block an initiator from LUNs or to pair initiators and LUNs together. There's no risk to the data. We don't have to swap the controllers. It's safe. It's easy. And best of all, we have certified HBAs that can be added in. And our storage controllers are on the VMware Ready HCL. And now, Jim. So the Edo uh, Extreme Core storage controllers are not storage. So as we, as we mentioned, as Eric mentioned, they connect and share up to 960 drives. Uh, it can be SAS JBODs uh, full of spinning disks, uh, JBOD full of flash disks, or a RAID array. It basically takes these SAS drives and presents them over fiber channel to be able to be shared at a high rate of speed to multiple workstations, multiple clients. Um, the, the speeds can get up to about 6,400 megabytes per second per controller and about 1.2 million 4K IOPS per controller. So they're, they're very fast. Um, it shares the direct attached storage and basically disaggregates hosts and storage, allowing you to scale storage and add storage as you need it without having to open up a server to add new storage. It also gives you the ability to remotely locate that storage. If there's a desire or regulation that requires you to move that storage away from your servers, it allows you to do that as well. Uh, there's no change to the data that's on the, on the storage that's attached to it. Uh, Extreme Core basically presents that storage. Um, there's a RAID group out of there if it's just a JBOT disk in the same manner that it does going up to the host. So we have four different flavors of this product that are out or coming out shortly. 
Uh, we do have 16 gig products available now, which connect uh, Gen 5 or Gen 6 fiber channel to 12 gig SAS. It's also backward compatible to 8 gig fiber channel and 6 gig SAS. So you could attach multiple 6 gig arrays to this and aggregate the performance of those 6 gig arrays as well and get better performance over the fiber channel connections. We do have a 32-gig version of this product coming out in the first half of 2018. And we will also come out with the iSCSI and ICER version of this, which connects Ethernet to SAS protocols. Um, and you can see some of the specs and speeds and feeds here. All the performance is about the same at all the models except the 7500, which only has two fiber ports instead of uh, four like the 7550. There's a user interface that allows people to um, interact, control the product in and out of band. And the 7500 as well is VMware certified and VMware ready. So there's some detailed context information for you here. So if, uh, on our website at addo.com, if you go under solutions, you'll see the VMware solution um, page on the addo.com website, which have all the information about this product. We have a tech brief that's available, a solution brief on the solution. Uh, we also have tech briefs on the product themselves. We are also listed on the VMware Solution Exchange and the VMware Compatibility Guide, so we're compatible and certified with VMware. I would say that we do have demo and email units of this product. If you're interested in trying this out, seeing how the product works, trying to see if this is going to work for your environment, you can contact uh, Mary Jeffers, whose name is listed up here. If you're a buyer or reseller and you're interested in reselling the solution, in the United States, you can contact Daniel Brockta or internationally Mark Wilson. Same goes for if you're looking to buy the solution, if you want to find out more about how the solution works. And on the call today was Eric Garrison. His contact information is here as well. If you have any technical questions about how this might fit into your environment, if you have other questions that you're, you're concerned about, please give us a, a call, uh, email on that as well. And you can contact TAP for any VMware-related questions. Uh, I'd like to thank VMware for being part of this presentation and helping us along with uh, this whole dash to scan uh, solution. And right now, if you have any questions, if we have any that are listed under the next slide, please bring them now. I know we have a couple that came in. Um, let's give you a chance to write any others if you have any. So we do have one question that came in for Eric. Will VMware notice any changes to the data store when your controller is added? Will there be any? The pathway will change. The data store signature will not. So. Uh, again, as I said in the uh, presentation, typically when I'm doing these, uh, a rescan of the host, telling the host to rescan the storage, will detect the data stores, um, and it just discovers a new pathway, sees the signature, and the data stores come in and pass. Okay. Um, there have been a few instances where we've had to go beyond that. But at no, uh, at no point have we ever really impeded the time involved with doing these or uh, lost any data. It's been fairly straightforward. Great. Two more questions here. There's one, is there any other software required to use the controller with VMware? No. What, what you have now, as far as your VMware licensing, is going to be uh, appropriate for adding the storage controller in and creating a SAN. The, there's no VMware licensing to use a SAN. Okay. Uh, two more questions now. We've got one more in. So if a user already has a SAN installed, can your controller be used to add SAS storage to an existing SAN? Is it? Absolutely. So, right. Yeah. So if you have a fiber channel SAN, then the storage controller becomes a part of that. Uh, and whatever you put behind it, uh, and I'm going to go out on a big limb here and say that that's some kind of SAS storage, be it a SAS RAID array, uh, a shelf of SAS or SATA drives or SSDs uh, or even mixes of, of all of the above, um, that then gets presented out onto the fiber channel SAN and you can and the host can make use of it. And again, you have the ability if you want SSDs one, two, and three to go to host number one, we can block that off and then you can go into the configuration of host one and say, I want to use a remote flash. Uh, and all three of these drives, and then I can allocate, uh, allocate a certain amount of those drives to each individual VM uh, so that it has read cache. Okay, great. Um, finally, we've got, this, this is an easy one, I can take this one. 
Can and can I add new storage behind the controller if needed? So we went over that briefly, but once once everything's installed and the existing storage is moved over behind the extreme core, you can add more storage behind there. We support up to 960 total devices behind an extreme core. So adding new flash or adding new spinning disks or RAID arrays is it's just a matter of connecting it behind the controller, not installing it inside the server. Correct. And one of the things to know is when we say devices, um, if you have a RAID array with two volumes, those count as two LUNs. And that is part of that uh, 240 or 960 drive count. Uh, I just, at some point, there will be that, that diminishing returns. Uh, obviously, we don't want to store 25 RAID arrays with a total of 960 LUNs or volumes being mapped to us. It's just uh, the, the piggybacking required would probably make the whole thing a little bit slower than it's practical, but additional bridges could certainly aggregate them and uh, bring the whole thing up to probably a much higher performance level than they've had. All right. Well, that's our last question, and I uh, thank everyone for participating and uh, calling in to learn and see our webinar, How to Convert Your Direct Attached Storage to a SAN. I'd like to thank Suds and Eric for helping us along to this webinar, and have a great day.